Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Tuesday, February 20th, 2024 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next, <clears throat> excuse me, 30 minutes or so as we prepare for yet another trading day, another trading week. And actually, uh, now we're kicking into gear in the second half of the first quarter, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some numbers, but uh, normally, uh, the first half, the first quarter tends to be much stronger. Um, and now we go into the second half. We've got some issues too, um, from a, uh, a more of a technical perspective, uh, looking at sentiment, some of those things uh, certainly pointing to perhaps a little bit of trouble ahead. Uh, currently, we do have futures down a little bit this morning. <clears throat> Let me give you those numbers real quick um, before we get into the action. Um but right now we got the down the diamonds, which track the Dow Jones down about one third of one percent. Spider uh, down a little bit more than one third of one percent. The QQQ, which tracks the Nasdaq 100, down almost a half of one percent. And small caps IWM down more than nine tenths of one percent, back below the 200 level after just recently threatening a uh, breakout up near the 205 area. So I uh, wrote about it a little bit uh, recently, but the Russell 2000 has completed a cup off of a, a nice uptrend. So that is a bullish pattern, but uh, don't be surprised by weakness and a handle. And that seems like what we are uh, maybe in process of printing right now. Um, let's go ahead and jump in to the action. Um, I can tell you that on, uh, or at 5.30 later today, we're gonna have our uh, top 10 draft picks uh, event. We do this quarterly for stocks to fill out our three portfolios our model portfolio, our aggressive portfolio, and our income portfolio. Last quarter, uh, model portfolio got right back on track, had a huge quarter, more than doubling the S&P 500 return. And as many of you probably know, uh, our model portfolio has more than doubled the S&P 500 since November of 2018. Uh, so what we did last quarter is typical of what we've done really over the last five and a half years or so. And uh, we're going to be drafting our top 10 stocks for that model portfolio at 5.30 later today. If you'd like to be part of that, all it takes is a trial subscription, which is a free 30-day trial. Of course, all members uh, invited to all of our events. Uh, but if you want to join, you're not currently a member, make sure you go to earningsbeats.com. I'll show you that a little bit later in the show. But just sign up for a free 30-day trial and you can attend. Find out which 10 stocks made our list for the model portfolio for the next quarter. All right, getting into the uh, action from Friday. Dow Jones Industrial Average finished down 145 points. Everything still looks pretty good, except we do have a negative divergence still across our major indices. That could play out, especially now that we're into the second half of the first quarter. We know things tend to slow down. We've got a technical sign literally staring us in the face on these daily charts. So even though we're still up near all-time highs, don't be shocked if we get a little bit of a pullback and watch those rising 50-day moving averages. I think that uh, level is going to be important in the short term if we do start to see some selling. And that means maybe as much as 3 4% on the S&P 500 in addition to what we saw at the end of last week. S&P 500 did lose about one half of 1% on uh, Friday uh, throughout the day. And the NASDAQ 100 dropped almost a full percentage point, dropping 160 points. S&P 400 mid cap index dropped close to 1%, down 0.93%. Uh, and small caps, worst of all, down 1.36%. Uh, that was close to $3. And that IWM, after getting close to 205, back down to 201.66. And again, as I just mentioned, futures at least now, with about 25 minutes to go to the opening bell, futures are suggesting that maybe we'll be back down below 200 at the open on the IWM. Transports, uh, worst of all, even worse than the Russell 2000 on Friday, dropping one and three quarter percent or close to that. Really getting close to this trend line, uh, maybe a trend line support. I know this, this trend line only goes back about 30 days, so not exactly the strongest trend line, but this would mark perhaps the third low that connects and we'll see whether or not we hold up. Looking at all of these AD lines, I continue to see very, very strong uh, accumulation distribution 
And the mid caps, you can see actually going back now, they're at a six month high after not exactly doing great just a month ago, uh, struggling a little bit relative to the other indices. We've now seen a lot more of what appears to be accumulation in the mid cap area and small caps also not quite moving to a six month high, but also trending higher in February uh, during a period where the market has kind of overall cooled down just a little bit. Uh, not quite the strength that we saw the, uh, through the uh, prior three months. So maybe we're losing a little bit of that momentum going to roll over. Uh, we had a couple big reports out this morning, more so for the Dow Jones than for the other indices, but uh, Walmart reported. Um, I know they came in with strong revenues. Uh, they beat on the bottom line. Stock was up in pre-market. Uh, we can take a real quick look at that. Uh, Walmart pre-market up. Uh, well, actually, almost eight dollars now, four and a half percent. Really nice. Home Depot, though, their guidance was a little weak, and as a result, Home Depot down about two and a half percent in pre-market. So we do have that to deal with um, as we open today's session. So that may weigh a little bit on the Dow, but the big report I think that almost everybody is waiting for will occur on Wednesday after the close. That's when Nvidia reports their latest quarterly results. I can't help but think it's going to be anything other than a blowout report. But that doesn't always translate into higher prices. We've seen a huge run in NVIDIA. We've seen a huge run in a lot of the semiconductor stocks. A lot of talk on the Super Micro, SMCI. Um, uh, Applied Materials just came out with a huge report last Thursday evening. And as a result, made a nice move on, uh, on Friday to an all-time high. So we have seen a lot of really good semiconductor performance. The overall index has been the best out of 103 industry groups over the last year. Semiconductors are number one, looking down at everybody. So expect a good report. The question is, is it already built in? Have you know traders bought so much of it and are expecting such high results that NVIDIA really needs like, something more than a blowout to keep taking it higher. I don't know. Um, it's going to be a really interesting report on Wednesday, especially since we're coming in the second half of this first quarter where we've already made big gains. We've got other issues, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the show, fairly significant short-term issues, not long-term. I remain extremely bullish long-term, but short-term over the next one to three weeks, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see 50-day moving averages get tested. Also wouldn't be surprised to see the market move to new highs because we're in a secular bull market and they tend to be extremely resilient, but I'm not going to you know, hide the fact that there are some warning signs out there in the near term. And I think if you're a short-term trader, I think it becomes more critical to consider them. As a long-term trader, this is like a blip on the radar. The problem is as a long-term trader, if you see warning signs and you get out, what do you do if the warning signs don't pan out and mark and the market keeps going up? What do you do as a long-term investor? Jump back in after you just gave away some of the gains, you know, sat out some of the gains. It, psychologically, it's a hard thing to get out, watch the market move up and then jump back in at higher prices. Normally you're like, okay, at least get back down to where I got out, then I'll jump in. And a lot of times the market doesn't wait for you. It doesn't pull back. It doesn't operate like that. And so we've got to be a little careful as we go into this period. But at the same time, from a long-term perspective, you got to ask yourself, is it worth the risk of missing out on continuing bull market action by trying to catch a short-term pullback? I would say for most long-term investors, it's not worth the risk. But you make your own decisions. Anyway, uh, certainly those negative divergences are one area that we are a little concerned about. But on the flip side, the AD lines look really good. Moving on to the sectors, uh, just wanted to point out what wasn't working at the end of last week. Communication services dropping almost 1.6%. Real estate dropping more than 1%. And technology down nine-tenths of 1%. So two of our big three aggressive stock or aggressive sectors, communication services and technology, struggled on Friday. That created some headwinds for the market. And we'll see what happens throughout this week. But again, for technology, the big report will be NVIDIA. Um, all right, didn't mean to do that. Anyway, uh, moving on to the industry groups. 
areas that did not perform well. Three consumer discretionary groups I wanted to mention. Travel and tourism dropped more than 2.6%. Home builders, home construction, just about 2.5%. And footwear, down more than 2%. All three in the consumer discretionary area. All three not performing well. And all three looking a little bit different on their chart. Travel and tourism has been straight up this year in 2024, one of the strongest areas of the market. Home construction was really strong when the interest rates were going down, but now that rates have been consolidating and even moving up a little bit, we've been seeing home construction struggling, uh, just kind of going sideways, still in a bull flag. So maybe we get that breakout to the upside, which should be respected if we do. But here's your flagpole and here's your flag. So I would say a breakdown below maybe around 2275 would be worth noting to the downside. Meanwhile, let's get up through about 2440, 2450. And that would be into breakout territory. Footwear, not so good. So we had really strong, but with a negative divergence. Sideways consolidation, that momentum has been unwinding back down near the center line. And then footwear, which had the big gap down back at the end of December with Nike's earnings report really unable to get things going. In fact, that 2200 level was the reaction high the day of that Nike earnings report. And we've made our way all the way back there. We've got some footwear stocks that are doing really well. Um, Crocs has picked up. Um, uh, uh, Deckers has been doing really well. But we've got Nike still struggling. And as a result, we have not been able to get through 2200. Let's see if we can do it maybe this week. Um, but right now, footwear showing some relative weakness. All right, 10-year treasury yield. Let's get a quick update, <clears throat> see where we are. The yield still stubbornly staying above 420, which is uh, noteworthy because uh, we were in a sideways consolidation pattern off of this downtrend. And you can see 420 was the high, right around 380, 378 was the low. And so I was looking at it as a trading range. Well, we broke out of it to the upside. You can see that candle from about a week ago. That was last, uh, maybe last Tuesday. Anyway, that breakout, oh yeah, that was with the uh, stronger than expected um, January CPI report that came out. That's when uh, we saw rates jump uh, through that 420 level. Now look at the rising 20 day moving average, which is up at uh, 417. So we got 420 yield support and 417 20 day moving average. As long as that continues to hold, I would say short term, uh, 10-year treasury yield, the, the short-term picture looks um, bullish for the yield. looks like it's going higher, which would be bearish for the underlying bond. Not really a whole lot more there. Let's move on to the S&P 500. Uh, you can see the S&P 500 moving back up, challenging that uh, 5,047 level. I think that was the uh, high on an intraday basis. Let's see, 5,048. So 5,048, we got back up to... 5,038 on Friday, but then reversed back down. So we saw the first weakness come in with that CPI report. We got a nice little bounce back, but when we bounced back last week, we didn't really get a bounce back in some areas, uh, many areas of growth and uh, some of the uh, more aggressive sectors. They kind of lagged. So this could, I mean, it's certainly looking technically like it might be like this last gasp of this current move to the upside and that we've got some weakness ahead. And I always say that, you know, half confident because I don't like to bet against the secular bull market. Um, they can be, you know, terrorizing to a bear um, and to any bearish tendencies, especially if you think you want to be on the short side, market takes off. Not only are you missing the upside, but you're actually losing uh, ground because you're going against the market. You're betting against it. Tough call, always a tough call on a secular bull mark, market to really get aggressive on the short side. That's not what I do. Personally, I just try to avoid any kind of leverage. Anything that's high risk, I try to lessen and I try to maybe focus a little bit more on the lower risk areas, uh, especially in my trading. If I trade individual stocks, uh, chances are I'm not going to be jumping into semiconductors or internet stocks because those stocks have made big runs. They're overbought. And those are the areas that are likely to see more profit taking. So you want to be careful in some of those aggressive areas. Again, areas that might interest me would be something like healthcare and financials. 
um, which uh, have been doing much better of late. Um, they're more, some of that those areas are more value oriented. So if we see money continue to rotate out of growth, they could benefit. So that's just the change for me in how I would approach this market. Um, just be careful here over the next week to three weeks. I really think um, his, history plays on the side of the bears. Um, we've got some technicals that I've already told you, and we're going to look at a sentiment chart a little bit later that also points to a possible pullback occurring at any time. NASDAQ 100, similar, although because growth is starting to lag a bit, we really didn't get nearly as close to that high on the NASDAQ as we did on the S&P 500. Russell 2000, there's your cup. So you see that big move up. I like uh, what's going on in the Russell 2000. Got the cup. We did pull back on Friday and we're showing futures down almost 1% or we were as of what, 10 minutes ago. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to maybe watch for this 20 day moving average test as a handle, maybe even getting down to where we were recently. I mean, if you look at this cup as being from about 206, 205 down to about 187 and a half. I mean, the uh, midway point would be about 196 in the cup. And that would be between the 20 day moving average and where we were last week. Just below that 195 level, maybe even as low. Well, intraday, I think we got down to around 193. I think 195, 196 could play into it. Maybe just the 20 day moving average, which right now is sitting at 197.26. But that area, I would say 195 to 197. Would not be surprised. That would be a handle. Um, and the market has been strong. So a little profit taking here wouldn't hurt. Historically, this is not a very good week. Uh, we do pick back up as we move into the beginning part of March. But for now, until toward the end of February, we do tend to see the market be a little weaker. All right, uh, let's keep moving. Let's go to the transport. So the transport's lost the 50 day moving average, which we did on the last two recent pullbacks. Um, but this one, again, we've got like an equal top. We got all the way up and actually had a breakout, but it was a false breakout. And so that makes me a little more cautious that maybe this is going back down to the recent lows. So you got equal highs, equal lows. And we're just in this consolidation phase. Futures down this morning. Let's watch this. But 15.2 would be a really uh, important short to intermediate term support level on uh, transports. So watch this 15.2. Again, just as a refresher, we had the double top here, a little bit of a bottoming head and shoulder pattern, left shoulder, neckline, head, right side of the neckline, right shoulder breakout, with that breakout expanding volume. So that breakout was at about 15.2. We've come back down three times, four times to this 15.2 level, and it's held every time. That's why 15.2 is a, a level that I'd be watching on the transportation group. All right, moving on, chart of the day. First, I want to just point out top 10 stock picks. This is, I think it's the biggest day of the quarter for us. So we have four of these uh, where we are doing stock portfolio drafts. And that's what I like to call it. I like to call it our draft. Um, imagine uh, being the GM of an NFL team and they say, okay, with the first 10 picks in the draft, because essentially that's what you're getting when you put together a stock portfolio you're going to put 10 equal weighted stocks together. It's not like you're drafting against other folks and you know they take NVIDIA and so you can't take NVIDIA or they take another stock, Chipotle, which has been strong. That means you can't. No. Top 10 stock picks is a draft where we get the top 10 picks. We got thousands of stocks to choose from. So our competition is the S&P 500, which owns 500 companies. I mean, I would hope that we could pick 10. I mean, it doesn't happen every quarter. I mean, after all, you got portfolio managers that basically get the same option. They've got a draft. They can put anything they want to their portfolios. They can't beat the S&P 500 for the most part. I think it's like 80% of them. That's the estimate that I generally have seen over the years. 80% can't beat the S&P 500. I mean, sounds to me like probably should take up golf or something else. We try to do it every quarter. Forget about annual. We try to do it every quarter. Go pick 10 stocks that you believe are going to beat the S&P 500. And what we, we do try not to get too overly weighted in one group, just because semiconductors have been the best group for the last year. Doesn't mean they're going to be the best group next quarter. And you put 10 stocks, 10 semiconductor stocks into a portfolio and semiconductors decide 
it's time for a little bit of a um, vacation and your portfolio is going to get trashed. So we do try to mix and match so that we don't have any over-representation in any one industry group, but we will favor sectors a little bit. We will kind of try to overweight the sectors that we believe will outperform. Anyway, at 5.30 today, I'm going to explain how we go about our process, what we do, and I'm going to show you top, our top-down approach, how we move into these stocks, and um, hopefully it'll be enlightening for anyone who hasn't seen this before, because again, we do have a really good track record at beating the S&P 500 with these picks. Anyway, 5.30 today. Click on this register now button, and this is what you'll get. You'll get a landing page that helps to explain a little bit more about what we do, what you can expect to learn, and there's your sign-up form. Free 30-day trial. You can un unsubscribe from our business or cancel your, your subscription at any point over the next 30 days. All right, so let's talk about the, the uh, chart of the day because the chart of the day is a semiconductor stock, but it's only about a $3 billion uh, market cap semiconductor stock, which is nowhere near the 1.7 trillion or whatever uh, NVIDIA is now, or the hundreds of billions that we see many of these other large semiconductor names. But maybe the other, the other uh, areas of semiconductors pull back. Maybe this is a time for IDCC to run. Here was their latest quarter, just came out last week. First of all, look at the huge pop in uh, volume. That was the first thing that stood out to me. The second thing was it actually gapped up above the prior open. And that normally tells me that's a bullish sign. So one of my trading, one of my favorite trading strategies is to get a stock that beats revenues, beats the estimates on revenues, beats the estimates on um, earnings per share, raises guidance, which they've made a huge raise in their guidance, both revenues and earnings per share and then gaps up above resistance. And when I like to get in is when they pull back intraday because a lot of times when you, at the open, everybody's jumping in and market makers are on the other side of the trade. So they're literally taking short positions at the opening bell, which is why a lot of times you will see morning weakness. So in this case, we saw IDCC, everybody gets excited, we gap up. The key was we gapped up above resistance, which makes me turn very bullish on the stock. And then when it pulls back intraday, that creates an opportunity. Here it came right back down to the moving averages, very close to actually filling the gap from the close the prior day. Now, remember, the close the prior day, this news isn't out. So all of a sudden, after earnings, if you gap up, you break out, and you go back close to where you were the prior day, you're getting it at the same price as you could have got it, gotten it before all the great news just surfaced. I mean, it seems like a no-brainer, and a lot of times it is. And IDCC came rallying back and has continued moving up another big volume day, looking back on a relative basis. These last two or three days, especially the last two, extremely heavy volume. So this is a, actually a stock that I'm considering pretty strongly for the next quarter. I mean, I like the gap up. I like the breakout. I like the increasing volume. Love that raised guidance. I mean, the raised guidance was amazing in terms of how much it was raised on uh, both top line and bottom line. AD line breaking to new highs. I mean, there's not a whole lot here not to like other than the fact that the entire semiconductor group is just overbought. Um, but anyway, I wanted to point this out. Um, we don't always have to talk about the NVIDIAs and the AMDs and the Applied Materials and the KLA Corp and the Texas Instruments. Of course, I haven't been talking about Texas Instruments too much because it's been lagging its group for so long. It's not worth talking about. Um, you know, us at uh, Earnings Beats, we are interested in relative strength leaders and Texas Instruments doesn't qualify. Uh, and sorry to all those Texas Instruments folks, but um, just call it the way I see it. Go with the leaders. Stick with the leaders. All right, let's uh, keep moving. We've got about four minutes to go. I wanted to show you the sentiment chart. And this is one I've been talking about, wrote an article at Stock Charts over the weekend about it. Uh, it was in the weekly market report that I sent out to members uh, late last night. So you'll have that. You've got that weekly market report. You can go check that out. That's a very, very lengthy report. We do a report every day. But the first day, first trading day of the week, 
we normally will do or we do a weekly market report, which is more big picture. So if you find yourself saying, I'm not a trader, I really just want to be kept abreast of what's going on in the big picture. The weekly market report is definitely something you want to look at um, because we're taking a much wider view of the market. We don't care necessarily about what happened last week. Um, it's more about looking you know, bigger, blowing up the picture and looking at, for instance, a 100-year chart on the S&P 500, getting a sense of are we in a bull market or a bear market? Um, and then kind of going digging down from there in terms of rotation and some other things that could drive the market uh, to the upside or downside. Anyway, the five-day moving average of the equity-only put call ratio, it's probably, well, it's not probably, it is my favorite sentiment indicator by far. Some people look at the AAII or, you know, these other surveys where, you know, you're asking folks, are you bullish or bearish? And then, oh, I'm bullish, I'm bearish. Okay, that's what they're feeling. What are they doing with their money? I, I don't care about how everybody feels. I mean, feelings can go up and down. Market goes up. It's, it can be swayed by media. It can be, what are you doing with your money? That's all I, I care about. And retail traders tend to go too far. And the equity only put call ratio, equity, the equity only puts and calls are more, are tra tra traded much more heavily by retail traders. The um, institutions, when they're buying puts and calls, many times they're looking at index puts and calls. Um, they're not really going into individual stocks. Um, and so as a result, what we see on this chart, the equity only, kind of gives us a summary of how bullish or how bearish retail traders are in the near term. And if, if retail traders are really bullish and they think the market can't go down, then they will start piling into calls. And that put call ratio, puts being on the uh, numerator, calls being on the denominator, if you're getting a lot more in the bottom, then that fraction will start to, to diminish and go down and down and down. And so when you get these low readings, when we get these drops and these peaks or valleys uh, to the bottom, anytime we've gotten down, this five-day moving average has gotten down to about 0.54 to 0.57. Pretty much have marked them all on here, most of them. Could have marked that one. That one actually didn't come in at the top. But look at all these red arrows and look on the price chart of when these readings hit. And then tell me whether or not you want to be cautious. Because this is telling us that the retail trader now has become a little bit too bullish in the near term. In other words, too much money is trading calls. And again, you look at these red arrows and you see not a whole lot of upside potential after we get down to these le levels. Now, let me caution you about one thing here. We had a reading here that was in this range right here. Um, and we ended up going down just a little bit. But look at this as we went up. This went all the way down to 0.475. This over here went down to 0 0.450. Here, this was 0 0.50. We don't know that we're going to stop going down at 0.54. We could get more bullish and this five-day moving average moves down into the 0.4s, which means market could continue moving up. But any time we have gotten to this level, we should be at least thinking in the back of our mind that this could be a top, short term. So again, is it 100%? No, nothing's 100% but it's another signal that tells us we could pull back. So we got history telling us that we could pull back with the whole first half of the first quarter, second half of the first quarter. I know historically the next week to 10 days, not exactly very bullish for the market historically, um, go, dating back to 1950 on the S&P 500. So we've got some issues out there that we need to be aware of. We've got negative divergences on the daily charts. So it's the combination of different risk factors that makes me get a little bit more and more and more cautious in the near term. But remember, I, this is not a long-term call. If we get a pullback, the S&P 500 gets back to 4,800, I'll be looking at possibly getting into leveraged long positions. That's just my strategy. Once we unwind 
from some of these signals, thing, especially if we get into March um, and things, you know, start, they've been, we pulled back and now we're getting closer and closer to, to earning season in April again, we could start to see another run to the upside. So that's the way I'm approaching it. All right, we have uh, just opened in the market, but I want to show you one of the things when we start our top-down approach, um, I like to look at what sectors are leading the S&P 500. So this right here is a five-year relative chart of the XLK, which is technology, relative to the S&P 500. Look at it. I mean, you can bet against technology, but the odds are it's going to come back to bite you. Technology has been really strong. I mean, 2022, during the cyclical bear market, we saw weakness. But if you throw that out, we've been going almost straight up now for five years on, in the technology area relative to the S&P. So if you're going to put together a portfolio to beat the S&P, doesn't it just make common sense that you might want to focus a little bit on technology? I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's, it's almost so simple that it hurts my brain. I mean, we make things so complicated in the stock market and we're always worried, you know, now, oh my gosh, it's the Hindenburg Omen. That sounds brutal. I mean, might as well be, you know, the, the Titanic sinking or whatever. Hindenburg Omen is, I mean, that was bad. Wasn't that like a fiery crash or something back in the 1930s? I don't remember exactly what it was, but it wasn't good. And now they're labeling the stock market. So the stock market's going to go up in flames, right? That's why I don't listen to the media. It's clickbait. What they don't tell you is that this only works. The Hindenburg Omen, which is supposedly a breadth indicator, which can tell us the market's going to top. You know what? Peter Schiff can tell us the market's going to top. Like twice out of every 20 years, he can do it. The Hindenburg Omen is 25% now. And this is a source. I don't even know where the source was that I read. So I have not done the research on this, but I read, so I'm gonna be clear, I read, it's not my information, that the Hindenburg Omen has worked. In other words, the market has had a pullback 25% of the time. And the Hindenburg Omen is taking credit for the pandemic in 2020, which I don't really think anyone could have seen that coming. And if you did see it coming and you're waiting for the market to drop, by the time the pandemic first hit and you're like, wow, okay, we're getting hit hard. By the time you jump out, we're just about bottoming. So I don't even think the Hindenburg Omen really worked in that situation. I think it was more that came up with a signal and we had a 100 year pandemic that happened to hit at the same time. But that's just my opinion. I'm not a fan of the Hindenburg Omen. I'm not a fan of breadth. I've told you that many times. I think that it's something you can keep an eye on. If it lines up with other signals, then okay, it adds to the bearishness, but I would never use it as my primary indicator. Not ever. Because what happens is the market keeps going up, breath returns back to normal, everybody forgets about it. You look back and you can't even tell that it didn't work. Everybody that talked about breath being an issue or in 2023, back at the beginning of the year, even at the start of, uh, the bull market at the end of 2022, where are they now talking about more breadth issues? They should come out and say, listen, the breadth didn't work last time. doesn't usually work, but we're going to point it out anyway. That's what should be said. But anyway, it's a clickbait. It's another thing to tell you that the market's going to go down when really the major market signals just keep pointing higher. At least the ones I look at, I think they've been pretty accurate. They just keep saying we're going higher. So short term, we could have some issues. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Next one to three weeks, I would not be surprised if the S&P got 4,800, maybe even 4,700 on an outside. That would kind of be my line in the sand. But longer term, I do not see this the end. I, I, not at all. I think we're going higher. And I think over the next several years, we're going to be a lot higher. But Anyway, that's where I stand on it. Let's take a quick look at what the market is doing. Then we'll get running uh, the Dow only down nine. So it's going to come back. S&P though down 20. So almost four tenths of 1%. NASDAQ down uh, two thirds of 1%, getting hit a little bit. Small caps already down about 1% on the day. 
So we are getting hit. And one of the things I mentioned in our weekly market report yesterday is that if we did get hit with some of the riskier, um, you know, risk on areas of the market, I thought the Dow might be the safe haven, uh, mostly because of the two earnings reports that were coming out. I thought they would be pretty good. Let's just get a one real quick look at the, um, there's Walmart, Walmart having a huge day today, up 6%. That is certainly helping the Dow. And Home Depot, even though it was down earlier, uh, a lot more, um, it has bounced back a little bit and only down 1.3%. So, so far, it is that flight to safety a little bit. Um, saw some selling on uh, Friday and it's picking up a little bit here. I'll take a look at the spider here for you. Let's do, definitely rolling over. Um, looking like it's going to be a little bit weaker. We'll see if the bulls have anything left in them to get back up close to that uh, 5,048 level. But it looks like maybe we're going to be in for a bit more selling here. The uh, S&P 500 is back below 5,000. We finished just above it on Friday, currently uh, down around 49.84 or so. The QQQ, low of the day, that's down about six-tenths of 1%. IWM. Gapping down, this is going to be an interesting one because if the market pulls back, I think IWM could hold up a little bit better than the others. Just because if it go, if we see more rotation into value, a lot of those areas of value like healthcare and financials, industrials, um, those are areas, even energy, those are areas that would benefit the IWM. So this relationship between the IWM, I know it's down a little bit more at the open, which has been the case for a while, but how do, how do we trade during the day? Does money rotate away from the QQQ and into something like the IWM or into the diamonds? I would think they would, it would, but I want to see some confirmation of that. Um, anyhow, that is it for me for today. Appreciate you uh, tuning in. Remember today at 5.30, this is one of the biggest events of the year. We actually do this four times a year. So one of the four biggest events of the year our stock portfolio draft, we're going to uh, unveil the 10 equal weighted stocks that will comprise our model portfolio, our aggressive portfolio, and our income portfolio. So uh, hopefully you will be uh, joining us for that later. Again, go to earningsbeats.com, hit that 30 day uh, no cost trial, or you can register simply by clicking, moving, going to that landing page. But we would love to have you. Have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.